In 2011, NASA retired the whole space shuttle fleet. The rest of us were kind of vying for something. Director Bolden at NASA decided New York City was a good place to be. There's actually a very famous photo of Discovery and Enterprise as they were exchanged. They fly in on a 747 with the Discovery. They unloaded it, rolled the Enterprise out, loaded it on the 747, and brought it to New York. It's sort of like a test vehicle. Well, yes, it's the prototype. Now, it was built as a spaceship, and you can actually tell that by the designation NASA gave it, OV-101. All the orbital vehicles were going to be in the 100 series, with the exception of Challenger, which is a whole other story. And Challenger doesn't have that 100 series number. It was actually Structural Test Article 099. So it wasn't meant to fly in space, and this one was meant to go in space. They prepared Enterprise to do the glide test, and there was actually five manned flights where they were released to glide down. The tile system wasn't even fully developed at that point in time. It's more of like an architectural type foam. It mimics the real tile in weight and density and thickness and size. Later on in Enterprise history, some real tiles were fitted on for the investigation into the Columbia accident. You can actually see them here. It's very easy to tell the real ones with all the stenciling on them. Can I like touch it? <laughs> so here we're looking at the left main landing gear door with the Columbia accident investigation. And we're really sure where that hole got poked in that caused the disaster. On the leading edge pieces, those scuffs you see, that's from when they were uh, actually shooting hunks of foam at these parts. And if you look over here, that little white square, you'll see little little wire leads would be attached to that. Those are actually stress gauges that the engineers left on after the investigation, which is kind of cool. It helps us tell the story. As they shot the foam at it, and they were actually able to see the force that the foam was making and were able to come up with the repairs and the changes in the shuttle program to prevent that from ever happening again. The reaction control system was never installed, but it is represented here. You can see these gray kind of ovals and circles. That's where these little reaction motors would be. And these are just little tiny rocket motors that can help you pivot and maneuver. And even some of the larger ones can actually help alter your orbit a little bit. NASA does a very good job at saving money when they can. And one of the things they did is they reused all the instruments out of here. And I was able to find some of those. I actually found them in a government surplus auction. This kind of representation shows you how really kind of regular airplane it really was. Yeah. You can see it's not complete. We include a uh, an image behind there shows the complete instrument panel of Enterprise. The kind of interesting thing is, is that a lot of those things are standard. They're not, you know, unique to a space shuttle. What they did determine, though, after building Enterprise, they made the structures pretty heavy. Each successive space shuttle was lighter than the previous. The inclination off the equator, the greater that angle is, the more energy it takes to get to orbit because you're not going directly into the rotation of the Earth anymore. You go meet up with maybe a satellite or the International Space Station. You want to get the space shuttle light because you want to carry more fuel, carry more payload. That uh, kind of half round portal there, that's where the crew would load in and that's where they would exit from. We don't use that door. That door weighs about 400 pounds. We actually have a little secret passage that's up in the main landing gear well. We have full access all the way to the tip of the tail cone, all the way to the crew module. I've actually taken astronaut Mario Runko inside. He wanted to see it because he wanted to compare it with the shuttles that flew in space. And from what he could see, it's identical. A lot of visitors come and say, hey, can I see the inside? And uh, we'd love to show you. But this is a national treasure. There's no place to walk in there, but we did install a plywood catwalk down the center. But the reason we go in there is because we're in the process of preserving this. And you've got to remember, this vehicle was built in the mid-1970s. It's not young. And we're going from the tip of the tail all the way to the nose. We're also going all the way out to the wingtips with a corrosion preventative compound. You're like embalming it then? From the inside out. In the late 1970s, it was approaching completion. Now, what were they going to name the shuttles? There were several panels and there was uh, competitions with school children. Most of the shuttles ended up with names like Discovery and Endeavor and Atlantis. But this vehicle was going to be named Constitution because it was going to be rolled out on Constitution Day in 1976. I think it may be hindsight, but it's not a great name for a spaceship. And so once again, the Star Trek fans, they rode in. And with a little bit of help, then Gerald Ford said, you know what, Enterprise sounds good, let's, let's go with that. The Leonard Nimoy's been a great friend to the museum when Enterprise was delivered to New York and brought him out there. And of course, he's making his famous. What we're going to do opening October 2014 and running through September 2015, 
The whole forward third of this pavilion will be a temporary exhibit dedicated to the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope because they fixed the Hubble five times. We're actually going to display the tools that actually came back from space. So that and a lot of other stuff. Can I touch it? Uh, no. I'm not allowed to or you think I can? Uh, you're not allowed to. She's serious.